We're not going to get into the real murder issues because there was really probably no intent to kill, but there was a killing. So when we're dealing with duty of due care, we're dealing with the, the tort of negligence. Negligence has four basic elements, duty, breach, causation, damages. What does that mean? We look to a situation and we say, is it foreseeable that if I commit a particular act, I could cause injury to another person? If we can say it's foreseeable, then I have a duty of due care toward that person to be careful. Yes, these vehicles are hard to stop when you're, when you're going a certain speed and, and you have momentum built up. But obviously there's no momentum here. He's, he could have been going, what, 10 miles an hour, 15 tops? He was obviously aware of you, of you guys. And he, was, he sat there for multiple light cycles. So he should have been extra careful, you know, and extra aware. Of, of his surroundings. Now, if I go ahead with my act and I injure that person, I have breached that duty. There's your second element, breach. This is so interesting. The fact that he, that he sat there in the street, I don't know what his temperament was. You know, like, is he just getting more and more worked up? Only people love pigs as much as they love dogs. For starters, he didn't need to do that. I mean, he probably shouldn't have been making the turn from the, the left lane like that. If we can say, but for my act, this person was injured, but for that, I am the cause. Now we look to see how egregious was the act that caused the injury. Was there reckless indifference to the party that was injured? A driver making a right-hand turn from a left-hand lane in violation of a code section who knows that there are people who are on the side of the road which he has deliberately tried to avoid. That's why he's over in the left-hand turn. Did this driver do anything to impede? We don't know whether there was any there's no skid marks. You know, we blew a horn to, to warn anybody, even though you know these people were there. But what was the intent of this person? It was obviously to avoid these activists. It looks like from looking at the crosswalk from where the driver begins the right-hand turn in that left-hand lane over to where the woman was struck. We looked to that, looked somewhere in the neighborhood of a good 40, 50 feet, maybe more, I don't know. She's standing right there, there's no bad weather, it's blue skies, it's a sunny day, she has a white head of hair, a black t-shirt, blue jeans, and she's nearly six feet tall, reading. she's a tall woman, a former model. And so this argument that, oh, I didn't see her, he was just angry and even when we finally called two minutes and said like time's up the way he whipped around the corner he went so fast like that's why when people say like this was an accident it's like there's no way he went so fast was Thank the driver you. under the influence of anything was the driver tested for alcohol and drugs at the scene we say when your behavior is is so so willful when your behavior is so reckless and indifferent to the victim that we can impose a penalty. And those penalties are substantial. And there could be some politics behind that. I'm sure, I'm sure the truckers union, maybe something that has to do with the, the packing house. And uh, <clears throat> it certainly has uh, probably political friends that it contributes to. They would have had an influence and say, wait a minute, and, they're, and, they, and they would try it very hard to try to shift the blame to the activists. You are the cause of all of this. If you weren't there, this would never have happened.
Come on, say your piece. You say hear. my piece? Get the fuck out of my face. That's my piece. You guys are unsafe. You're gonna get your fucking self killed just like that other little deputante. <laughs> Right now, the, the purpose of vigils, like the true meaning of vigils, is really losing its um, focus right now with us because of these counter protesters. Like the animals were already had nothing, like they just had these two minutes where we could just try and give a few of them just a moment of compassion. And like, they're not, the police aren't even letting us do that anymore. I'd expected a lot of human rights groups to be really supporting, you know, you would think, right? Like, who cares what was, who was on that truck or what was on that truck? Aren't human rights activists upset? Right. Like a human got killed for standing up for what she believes in. The truck was there for about four or five minutes. And uh, all, all I saw was the protesters walk away from the truck. This was totally, totally preventable. I feel sorry for uh, the victims' families. My heart goes out to them. I sympathize with them but they don't have to happen. So like, that's the kind of attitude, all the blame is taken away from the person that actually killed her. And it's putting on the activist because if we would just shut up and go home, she wouldn't have died. It was either on purpose or- Intimidation. More likely, more likely you better get out of the way because I'm not stopping. The police are not acting uh, in an objective way and they're not there to protect us. Right. They're there to protect um, powerful animal agriculture industry. But it does not absolve him of due care, a duty to be careful, the foreseeability of it all. It doesn't absolve him from why are you making a right-hand turn from a left-hand lane in violation of the code section. He was accelerating, like he didn't just turn at a normal speed, even a normal speed for turning for a truck. He knew he was there, she was there. Um, it looked like he was trying to hit her and that was intentional and the fact that he didn't stop when he dragged her, I fully believe that he intended to hit her. And we're talking about a barren industrial landscape, right? Almost like a football field, but it's concrete with a, with a, with a chain link fence. You can't, and two of us standing there. Um, he could see us. And, and you know, the, the amount of time that he was there like five, six minutes, there's nothing else to look at. What was his state of mind? And we get to intent. So then it brings us into the areas of uh, criminal gross negligence and manslaughter, where there is no intent to kill, but there is a killing. And then we take a look at the conduct of the driver and was there reckless indifference, some willful misconduct on the part. We can kind of bring his background into it to show that there's this proclivity or this propensity toward this behavior. And then we can find gross negligence. Does he have prior incidents? Does he have a clean driving record? Has he expressed animus towards animal rights activists? I'd want to talk to his friends and family. I'd certainly want to take a very close look at his social media, which is very revealing sometimes. First vigil I went to was in Toronto and one thing that struck me was not only was there a hostility among some of the truck drivers but there was even hostility among cars going by. I was there. I you were there. You. There was a car that just kind of, do you remember this, just kind of pushed through the people. The cop had to come over and, and he kind of pushed the cop. Well, sadly, when that happened, I don't even remember when you said that because it happens so frequently. I don't fucking bother you. Get the fuck out of my face, asshole. Get back in your car. Yeah, back in your car, sir. Whoa. Somebody call the cops. We are in the middle of this social norm that some animals we love and some animals we kill and eat. The ones who get upset with us, something about what we are saying strikes a chord in them. Something resonates. Hey! 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 
And so when I see people get upset, when I see people make jokes, that's just because the truth has, has landed deeper in them than they care to admit. Anyone that feels that strongly has a real guilt issue. Because if it means nothing to you, right. just keep passing by. I think it's about seeing these animals experience, seeing it right in front of you going, this is their life. This is what they're enduring because we have a population of people who are asleep and don't realize that they've been programmed to think we love some animals and, and kill and eat others. Animal vigils are uh, a unique type of activism. Uh, we stand in front of the gates of slaughterhouses and we see the animals fearful and hoping that someone will help them. Um, they're still persons. They're not dis dissembled yet. Uh, I think uh, it's important to see, um, it's, it's important to have a sense of accountability. You see, when you, when you go there and you see them, uh, it's unfiltered. You get to see, uh, look them in the eyes. Uh, these are moments before they're going to be brutally murdered. Um, and with other forms of activism, you, you don't necessarily see the victims firsthand. And there's something really powerful about seeing victims. Uh, uh, I think that's the root of um, mobilizing social movements. Being the victim really mobilizes people. It started with Anita. She was walking her dog and happened upon a transport truck at a stop and was able to look inside and saw these pigs and thought, somebody needs to do something about this. In 2015, she ran into a disgruntled truck driver who did not like the fact that she was trying to give the pigs water. And so he had arrested and charged uh, originally with criminal mischief facing uh, potentially 10 years in prison. Uh, you know, in our legal system, corporations have the status of persons. And, you know, animals who are our equals are, they deserve personhood. So basically, at the pig trial, we were fighting for compassion, not being a crime, but also to change the property status of animals mm -hmm. and to recognize pigs and other animals as persons. So basically, from one woman's actions, came a movement of over a thousand groups in over 70 countries. It's like you're on the front lines and then you show people who aren't on the front lines what's really happening right before, right before these animals are killed, which is hidden. police charged me with criminal mischief, interference with property. I, it was just so shocking for, for, for an, charging someone for an act of kindness. In this case, uh, the driver who killed Regan, um, his charge is uh, dangerous driving causing death. How do I feel about it? Like I was charged with a criminal charge for giving water and this trucker is charged under the Highway Traffics Act, a non-criminal charge. Um, I feel that the justice system is corrupt. When you go to a vigil, you, not only do you make the connection yourself, but you can share that uh, if, if you have some footage and photos, you can then share that with the world. And I find that's very effective, very effective. What do you think it was with Regan that she responded to that type of activism. I'm always interested why someone would come to a vigil where we don't really get to save the animal, we see them right before they die. It's... Like I remember her talking about Anita's case because she was going to the trials. She would have thought that the vigils are the best way to communicate the problem, period. Our last conversation was the day prior where she was telling me about the bill and how upset she was and she sounded very tired and she said to me you realize 
with this bill being passed? Do you understand the work that lies ahead of me? Laws are not bills. Bills are how laws are introduced. You introduce a bill, and if it passes through the various committees of the legislature, eventually being signed by, in this case, the Prime Minister, we now have a law, but we're only talking about a bill. Bill 156 is an ag gag bill that was introduced by the Conservative government in Ontario, and it was basically written by the animal ag industry. This is what they want passed into law. Now, you have to understand that a lot of things in a bill are negotiable. They will put them in knowing that they'll have to give up certain things to really get the major points. It's a law designed to, to cover up the truth, to stop us from documenting what's happening. That's what it is. They pass ag gag laws that say, we can't be investigated, we can't be photographed, we can't be filmed, nobody knows what's going on. Aggressive legislation that allows them to avoid the legal and economic consequences for their behavior. This is a law that purports to say, well, I guess there's some kind of zone around the truck that's private property, and that's absurd. As the truck moves along the streets and highways, it has private property, like encircling it everywhere it goes, and anybody who gets near it, passing somebody on a highway, am I now trespassing onto their private property? That's ridiculous. It looks like we're dealing with uh, people's right to assemble, people's right to freedom of expression, all of these types of issues will, are going to come out. And as I looked at the legal framework, I became much more interested in the underlying economic framework because it's really, the, it's the cash that drives the laws. People don't have interest in, in passing laws unless, unless they're going to make money from it. That's, and that's why laws get passed. Now they say it's to protect uh, the animals from humans, right? <laughs> or, or, and to protect them from getting diseased by us. I mean, really all we do is take pictures of them, give them kind words and maybe some water. So it, of course, it's the way that the, the law is, is worded is ridiculous. Uh, it's really designed just to hide the truth. There's no evidence that anybody has ever uh, caused stress to an animal by providing it water on a hot day or introduced contamination into the food supply by giving water to an animal. There's never been a case like it before. No precedent for it. That's a case of first impression. You will be making precedent. Case law. So we understand that there are two types of laws. Statutory law, laws that are passed, bills have been introduced and become statutes, passed through the legislature and case law, which are precedents that are cases that interpret, they interpret the law, and they're very, very important. My new sign. That's the first thing lawyers begin to look at is, first of all, we look to see how the cases are, uh, interpret that particular law. First of all, I want to start off by uh, expressing on behalf of the Halton Regional Police our sincerest condolences to the family and friends of the woman who lost her life here today. We got a call at about 10.20 a.m. Uh, for reports of a pedestrian struck by a transport truck hauling pigs in the area of South Service Road and Harvester Road in Burlington. I know the intersection where Regan was killed. And when I looked at the footage, I thought it was, this was a big truck, you know, this was a probably 50, 55 foot truck. Typically, if it's the same as like another like dry van, they're, they, they're usually around, I think, 73 feet. What struck me about, about the footage was that she, Regan was holding a sprayer. She was holding a water sprayer. And you can see where the sprayer got knocked aside, which is pretty close to the crosswalk. It's pretty close to the crosswalk, and there's this sort of sidewalk there, and there's this patch of grass, and there's a chain link fence. And her sprayer is way up there. And then there is this line, this whole line of, of, of body fluids. And it's the entire length of the truck. But what's interesting is that the rear end of the truck has cleared the crosswalk. It's come inside onto this service road. 
and her sprayer is way up by the street and it just, it would appear that he didn't. Where he hit her, where her sprayer was knocked away and where he stopped was beyond the length of the truck. This bill says that if you're driving a truck and you hit somebody, you're not responsible for, for uh, killing that person unless you did it intentionally or with reckless uh, or willful disregard for that person's safety. But there's a big gap there. What is that? Negligence. To come up with the gross negligence argument, we'd want to take a look, maybe take a look at his background. He claims he couldn't see her, there was another distraction, or she was in a blind spot. Well, I, don't, I didn't understand the or. Driving big rigs, I've, um, you can have a tire blow and, and you don't know. You've got people flashing their lights at you and help people help you communicate that way. You feel speed bumps, and this, it's, it's a bit uh, morose to say it like that, I think, but yeah, he should have felt that. If his excuse is a blind spot or a distraction, then careless driving is, is not enough. There is no blind spot, and you can see everyone on the curb from shoulders up all right. the way around the corner. Yeah, you definitely feel speed bumps. It's called a critical event. So yeah, hard, hard bumps, hard braking, things like that. It'll, it's always recording, but it, every, it, it'll take a chunk of eight seconds before and eight seconds after. It just wants to see before, during, and after the so-called critical event. That truck driver, he saw Regan. He was staring at Regan the entire time. Like he had like a clear view of her. I remember this massive garbage truck driving by us, honking. Like it was just absolutely chaotic. There was a moment when one of the witnesses, her name was Ellie, she was at the truck giving water and she stopped and she turned around and her phone was recording, so she did basically a 360. And in that moment, if you take it frame by frame, you could see where all seven witnesses were that day. There were seven people there, including Regan. Regan was standing over at the crosswalk, waiting. I have the right to cross. Pedestrians tend to always have the right of way. She cleared when we said cleared. The light turned green. She had the right of way and she was probably coming back towards us to join us. He suddenly burst forward because he'd been sitting there light after light after light. Uh, because of the, where the impact happened and where I was, I didn't witness it, but I certainly heard it. The sound was so loud. When he hit Regan, it was the loudest sound I've ever heard in my entire life. People, like everyone else thought that he hit the fence. In my head, it sounded like the truck had hit the fence. When the truck whipped around the corner, I heard like this really sickening, like crunching sound, and I thought the truck hit the fence. Like it, like it sounded like he crunched something. I heard. What did you? What did you hear? I heard a crunch. I just heard like it was like a, like a sickening crunch. And to, and he struck her near the near the crosswalk. If if her sprayer is any indicator, and to keep going, the length of his truck to clear that crosswalk and be past it before he finally stopped. And one of the witnesses said he never got out. When he hit her, um, I immediately ran over there and he didn't stop. It seemed like he dragged her for a long time. And there was a huge trail of blood because she had been dragged. And the only reason he stopped was because the security guard was screaming at him. Two possible things. One is this dude is super malicious. If you have somebody under your, your tires, you just keep going, that's pretty messed up, obviously. Um, and two is he didn't know. God forbid this was an intentional act or in the future there were intentional acts enabled by a law that a truck driver might see as a license to kill. I came around the corner um, of the back of the truck to the driver's side and the first thing I saw was just a trail of blood.
it didn't it didn't seem like there was anything that we could do it was pretty clear that she was gone regardless of what you think about um, whether you know the, the activist should be there or not um, there's never any excuse for for something like this this is Yeah, he, he should have seen her. I feel very lost without her. Let's do her friends. My daughter changed my life. I taught her in grade seven and eight. And in later life, I became the pupil. She was the greatest teacher ever. I don't know if it does any good, but I know it does. I know doing How nothing does no good. Yeah. I knew nothing about the food I was eating or any of that. There was no internet, you know. It was if it wasn't for Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation, that was that was my only insight as to what was going on. Once you open that door as to what's going on, it is a, just a world of shock. We've been sold a bill of goods our entire lives. Me, my parents' generation. It's, uh, it is shocking, absolutely shocking, the, the lack of regard for the feelings of our fellow Earthlings. It is shocking. There's the realization that if everyone saw this, people would not contribute to the animal exploitation and suffering. When you do a job like this, and if, you, if you're willing to think a little bit deeper, you know that this is something that the general population doesn't really know about and would probably be interested in it. This group feels there's an injustice and they're standing here to speak to it. We're standing beside them, as Regan would. Because I've been doing this activism since 1977, when the seal hunt was really first exposed. Yeah. That's when I got involved. 